Yesterday I was speaking mainly about college as an idea uh, with its origins in the Puritan church of three and four hundred years ago, a church based on the apostolic model of a voluntary gathering of the faithful for the purpose of deepening and disseminating their faith. Tonight I want to consider, or begin to consider, and we'll continue that in that vein tomorrow, what has happened to this idea and what meaning, if any, it retains for American colleges today. Now, this question won't be easy to answer, at least not in a responsible way, but I will try. In fact, it's probably what is sometimes called a badly formed question, since the category itself, college, is so plural and shows so much variation today that when we, get down, when we get down to particulars, we're talking not only about small colleges serving mainly local students that might look a little bit like the originals I was talking about yesterday, but about colleges within big universities that draw students from every state and many countries, arts colleges, business colleges, religiously affiliated colleges, countercultural, sports-oriented, for-profit, and community colleges, and most recently, password-protected online colleges with virtual classrooms that exist only in cyberspace. If the effects of the current financial meltdown prove as dire as some people expect, some of these colleges may not be around this time next year. And I will be talking tomorrow at some length about what I think the effects of the current financial crisis are likely to be, um, I have to say, it's a problem that's not so easy to notice from Morningside Heights, uh, though I suspect it may be even a little easier to notice from there than it is from Princeton. But it's real and it's out there, and it's affecting a lot of our colleagues at some very fine institutions. But for now, at any rate, America's system of higher education is the most vital and miscellaneous in the world. So making generalizations about it is a risky business, but that's what I'm going to try to do. Now one thing to keep in mind right away is that it seems to me we're quite often rather careless about using the words college and university, which is to say we tend to use them interchangeably. To some extent this has always been so. <coughs> 17th century Harvard that I talked quite a lot about yesterday was sometimes referred to as Harvard College and sometimes as the University of or at Cambridge. Just last week, you may have noticed an article in the New York Times under the title, Presidents of Colleges Give Back Some Pay. You know, there's a little embarrassment entailed at the moment in pulling down a salary over a million dollars in academia, but be that as it may, every president mentioned in that uh, article was actually the president of a big university, not a college, and in some cases a giant university. For our purposes, however, it's important to keep in mind that colleges and universities, even when they share a campus and a name, as they do here in Princeton, are actually institutions with, a, with very different purposes. Let me take a stab at defining the difference, though it may seem obvious to many of you. A college, I think, is about transmitting knowledge of the past to students so they may draw upon it as a living resource in their future lives. A university is a disparate array of research activities with the aim of creating new knowledge in order to supersede the past. These two functions are not necessarily irreconcilable, but I think it will be useful to consider how they have evolved and to a very large extent, I think, diverged. Now, until the last quarter or so of the 19th century, higher education such as it was in America was mostly about the first and very little about the second. Strictly speaking, there were no universities. It's one of the items, you'll remember, Henry James's famous catalog of all the things that are missing from American life in his book about Hawthorne, published in 1879, and I'm just sampling some of the things. No sovereign, he says, no court, 
No aristocracy, no country gentlemen, no palaces, no castles, nor manors, nor thatched cottages, nor ivied ruins, no cathedrals, nor abbeys, nor little Norman churches, no great universities. No Oxford, nor Eton, nor Harrow. What institutions there were of so-called higher learning were small and sectarian, and between the Revolution and the Civil War, their number increased nearly 30-fold. From the original nine, Harvard, Yale, William and Mary, the College of New Jersey, now Princeton, Brown, King's College, now Columbia, Dartmouth, the College of Philadelphia, now Penn, and Queens College just down the road, Rutgers, increased from nine to around 250. Almost all of them were, in Richard Hofstetter's words, precarious little institutions, denomination-ridden, poverty-stricken, in fact, not colleges at all, but glorified high schools or academies that presumed to offer degrees. And yet they proliferated at something like the same pace as did the churches, whose variety astonished European visitors accustomed to a single established state church to which conformity was enforced. The means by which colleges multiplied were much the same as the schismatic process by which new churches were created. I like to think of it as a peculiarly Protestant form of asexual reproduction. A bunch of spiritual discontent secedes from one institution and presto, a new one pops up down the road. Now, the ostensible reason for starting a new church or college was typically geographical. Something along the lines of, you know, we live on the other side of town. It's very hard to get to the meeting house on a bad weather day. But often the real reason was dissatisfaction with the local preachers or teachers. Yale, for instance, was founded by dissenters who thought Harvard had strayed from the true Calvinist faith. The idea for the University of Virginia first arose in the mind of Thomas Jefferson when he concluded that his alma mater, William and Mary, had sunk so far into what he called languor and inefficiency that reforming it had become simply impossible. Oberlin College officially founded in 1833, got its real start a year later when some 40 pro-abolitionist students transferred from Lane Theological Seminary in protest against the Lane trustees who had demanded that they stop agitating against slavery. As for Princeton, according to your second president, Aaron Burr, I feel compelled to remind you, father of the man who shot Alexander Hamilton, an alumnus of Columbia, you, you owe your existence to a charismatic Yale undergraduate named David Brainerd, who had been expelled from Yale for complaining that one of his tutors, and I quote him, had no more grace than the chair I'm leaning upon. If it were not for the treatment received by Mr. Brainerd at Yale College, Burr wrote, New Jersey College would never have been erected. Strikes me you might want to keep that in mind next time you go to the Yale-Princeton game. The bulldog, in other words, is parent to the tiger. So rooting against Yale is a sort of act of parricide, if I could put it that way. Now, like the churches, it can be said that these early colleges differed one from another, mainly in spiritual temperature. And so there's a sense that taking these differences too seriously in the long view is to dwell on what Freud famously called the narcissism of minor differences. They were all more or less Protestant, and if you look at them from 200 years later, they all look a lot alike. Most colleges required their students to read the same patristic and classical authors, to use the same rhetoric handbooks, and to take more or less the same capstone course on moral philosophy, typically taught by the college president. At Princeton, for 20 years, that would have been James McCosh, after whom the building in which we meet tonight is named. If we date this age of moral pedagogy, as one historian calls it, to the founding of Harvard in 1636, it can be said to have lasted nearly 250 years. Now, none of these institutions, unlike their modern counterparts and 
recall that I began yesterday by talking about how obsessed Americans are with college these days. None of these institutions at that time mattered to Americans very much. Apart from students intending to become ministers or school teachers, a college degree in antebellum America had little practical value as a means of entering the still small managerial class. The market, as we would say today, was limited. Only a tiny percentage of college-age Americans actually attended college. <clears throat> My work on Melville has been mentioned, so I'm always given to alluding to him, and this won't be the last time, but if you've read Moby Dick, recently published right at the midpoint of the 19th century, you may remember that when the owner of the whale ship Pequod wants to prepare young Ishmael for the fact that he's signing on to a ship with a very, very weird captain, the best way he can think to get his point across is to say, Ahab has been in colleges as well as among the cannibals. As if, you know, you go to college, you go to the cannibals, it's more or less the same thing. Now, with the Civil War, as with so much else, everything changed. After the subsidence of that great convulsion, as Henry James called it, no sphere of American life, technology, manners, art, race relations, of course, government, was left untouched, including religion and education. Emily Dickinson put the matter more vividly, more brutally, using an image of terrible salience as thousands of men and boys came home maimed or mutilated from the war. And it helps to recall in our time when we are again at war that the Civil War remains by far the most devastating conflict in our history measured in blood. 600,000 young men dead on both sides of the conflict. God's hand, she wrote, has been amputated. And this is probably a bad, grotesque elaboration of the image, but I think we can say with Dickinson that God's grip on the colleges was loosening. Now, educational institutions, I think I would venture the generalization, tend to be tenaciously conservative which is one of the paradoxes of the fact that we think of them now, a lot of people think of them as the, 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 the last uh, sanctum of, of radicalism. But in fact, they tend to be very conservative. So at first, the change was slow. Chapel remained compulsory. Faculty were uniformly and students at least nominally Christian and overwhelmingly Protestant. But there's another comment, this one from Emerson, that tells the tale of what was coming, I think. Culture, he wrote, is the predominance of an idea which draws after it a train of institutions. Which helps really to crystallize for me what I was trying to say yesterday, that there was an idea. It was a Protestant idea about a church. I used the phrase lateral learning, the idea of a mutually supportive community that got translated from church to college, and college arose as an institution largely out of that idea. But Emerson goes on, let us rise into another idea, they will disappear. He wasn't speaking specifically here about colleges, but I think the point is applicable. Now, the antebellum college did not exactly disappear. But it did increasingly and very quickly find itself in the shadow of a new institution that arose in response to new conditions. Call it post-Darwinian culture or mass culture or consumer culture or just plain modernity. Call it whatever you like. Under any name, these new conditions, some of the obvious features would include machine-made goods, mass production and mass consumption, motorized transport, first trains, later automobiles, instant communication, first by telegraph, then telephone, complex litigation and liability laws, and above all, the explosion of technical and scientific knowledge. All this demanded new leadership with a new kind of preparation, and the old-time college was simply not up to the task. 
For professions such as law, medicine, and engineering, the traditional apprentice system was breaking down. Even farmers were becoming agricultural business managers. And all of the above needed the kind of specialized training most efficiently delivered by formal educational institutions where experts gathered as a faculty in order to coordinate their expertise. Now, the break with the old-time college was neither neat nor complete. Such breaks never are. The history of all educational institutions, as I just suggested, tend to be conservative. Sometimes it's self-aware conservatism, as when the first president of MIT, despite his commitment to laboratory learning, remarked on, in his words, the greater impressiveness of knowledge when orally conveyed. A direct echo, I think, of the old Puritan sentiment they love to quote from the Apostle Paul, that faith cometh by hearing, that the, that the root to the, to, the, to the mind, indeed to the soul, is through the ear, not through the eye. I might pause to digress for just a second to say that perhaps my uh, favorite recent illustration of unwitting academic conservatism is a more recent one that comes from my own university, which built a few years ago a $60 million student center. Uh, the architect was very forward-looking, a self-described postmodernist, very with it, very now. He organized the whole building around ramps lined with mailboxes. And the idea was that the students would serendipitously bump into one another on these ramps, run into old friends, make new friends. The trouble was that the building went up at just the moment when everyone switched to email. So now no one goes to the mailboxes except to pick up the occasional Amazon package, which don't fit into them, with the result that the place is utterly deserted almost all the time. You could roll a bowling ball down those ramps and it wouldn't hit anybody on the way down. So, you know, academic intellectuals, I think, are not notable for their ability to forecast the future. I don't know how many um, academic Sovietologists predicted the demise of the Soviet Union. Maybe Steve Kotkin did. I don't know. Um, certainly the ones at my shop didn't. Um, anyway, by the end of the 19th century, both social and cultural conditions were changing at a speed that few people could keep up with, let alone anticipate. Most old institutions stuck in their ways simply could not or would not adjust. I came across a sentence a few days ago by the uh, legendary City College philosopher Morris Cohen, in which he says, college students were looked upon as children who were to be taken in hand by men of mellowed conformity and indoctrinated against radical ideas. Something like that seems like a fair description. Again, a gross generalization, but that's our stock and trade. The nation, in any event, needed more literacy and more numeracy among more people. It needed specialists with technical knowledge more than generalists with biblical or classical learning, or at least it thought it did. Now, the first significant response to these new imperatives was the passage by Congress in 1862, right in the middle of the Civil War, of the Morrill Act, granting federal land to the loyal states, 30,000 acres allotted for each senator and representative, in order to fund the creation of public colleges, chiefly in the newly settled West, where, in the words of the Act, the leading object shall be without excluding other scientific or classical studies, to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts. Thus was born the system of state colleges that has since evolved into some of the leading research universities in the world. Penn State, Wisconsin, Illinois, many others. At the same time, beginning in the East, Private philanthropists funded new institutions modeled on the renowned German research universities of the day, where the creed was academic freedom and research laboratories as well as graduate seminars first attained their modern form. Other universities began to take shape on that model around the core of a colonial college, Harvard, Columbia, Yale while still others, Chicago, Northwestern, for example, 
came into existence without any pre-existing foundation. In accordance with the earlier usage of the word university that I quoted yesterday from Jonathan Edwards when he spoke of God's whole creation as the university of things, the scope of these new institutions was virtually unlimited. Now the question arises and arose, what place was there in these institutions for the undergraduate student? Well, the first true research university in America, Johns Hopkins, like Clark University uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts, another new institution that arose in, in this period, initially took in absolutely no undergraduate students at all. And that decision, in fact, is something from which Hopkins is still trying to recover since uh, it eventually left them with a very small base. When they, I mean, they reversed the decision and created a college after a time, but it left them with a very small base of undergraduate alumni donors. Clark University uh, really never has recovered from the challenge. Hopkins today is, uh, I think, rather creatively created a program for talented middle, middle school kids, 12-year-olds, uh, 14, 15-year-olds, in order, as it were, to develop what we would call brand loyalty at an early age and to try to develop a new pool of future undergraduates. The first president of the University of Chicago, another institution that has struggled financially because it's really a, in a reverse pyramid, right? It's got a very small college at the bottom with a very big graduate school on top, as does Columbia, in fact. Uh, the, the first president of Chicago regarded the undergraduate department, this is a quote from one of his colleagues, as a temporary concession to the weakness of the founder, John D. Rockefeller, who apparently had a soft spot, spot for college kids. Meanwhile, ancient, by American standards, institutions such as Harvard and Columbia began to turn themselves into universities too, adding graduate programs and eventually professional schools. By the turn of the century, William James of the Harvard Philosophy Department was speaking famously of the PhD octopus, a tentacular image, while one of his colleagues in the history department recommended, and I quote, that the college ought to be suppressed or moved out into the country where it would not interfere with the proper work of the university. From New York, Cambridge looks like the country, so I don't know what the problem was there, but anyway. In this case, as in so many others, I think it's fair to say that Princeton was the notable exception. With your Presbyterian prudence, if I may put it that way, the same prudence that puts you in the best position, I suspect, to weather the current financial storms, you embrace the university ideal more slowly than any of the other early American colleges, except for maybe Dartmouth, although even Dartmouth now has a medical school and a, and a, and a business school. I don't need to tell you that today you still don't have that panoply of professional schools that your peer institutions have. You know, at Columbia we've got medicine, nursing, public health, social work, journalism, the arts, uh, business and law, of course, I probably left some out. And they may look like adornments in flush times, but in hard times such as right now, they look like an albatross. As for the educational mission of these new universities, the inaugural president of Hopkins expressed it well. It was, he said, this is 1876, the purpose was to show students, and I quote, how to extend, even by minute accretions, the realm of knowledge. I think it's worth pausing for a moment on that word, word extend. When the founders of Harvard spoke of their purpose in that passage I read to you yesterday to advance and perpetuate learning, they did not mean what President Gilman of Hopkins now meant by extending it. To them, advancing the truth meant spreading it. As when Cotton Mather spoke of God having irradiated the Indian wilderness by sending his chosen emissaries to America to carry his word to those who had hitherto lived in spiritual darkness. The commonplace metaphors that today come out of the mouths of all university presidents, we at fill-in-the-blank university, we work at the frontiers of knowledge. 
We work at the cutting edge of knowledge. Those metaphors would have been utterly incomprehensible, I think, for most of the first 200 years or so of American higher education. Now, the most influential of the post-Civil War university presidents was Charles W. Eliot, who became president of Harvard in 1869, a post he held for 40 years. It was different in those days. We had a president at Columbia for 45 years, from whom we're still trying to recover. Ever since the colonial period, most, maybe all, I haven't done the, done the check, uh, but certainly most college presidents had been clergymen. But Eliot was a chemist. He had taught at MIT, and in the 1870s, he introduced an elective system at Harvard by which college students could choose courses according to their talents and interests rather than, as in the past, follow a curriculum more or less common to all. Eventually, even conservative faculty came to appreciate this new system since it freed them to teach subjects in which they were expert and thus brought their teaching into conformity with their research. And to this day, basically, if you look at what Harvard calls its core curriculum, it's leading faculty talking about what they're interested in. Eliot thought that concentration, the word Harvard still uses today instead of the more common term major, should not wait for graduate study, but should begin in college. The job of the university, he wrote, was, I quote, to store up the accumulated knowledge of the race so that each successive generation of youth shall start with all the advantages which their predecessors have won. I call this the relay race theory of knowledge, by which all of human history becomes a team effort in which each generation passes the baton to the next and no runner is required to travel trodden ground. You start where your predecessors left off. Now, this relay race principle has proven to be a remarkable method for promoting and, to use Gilman's word, extending the truth. If you consider that it took several millennia for humankind to produce the two geniuses, Newton and Leibniz, who developed the calculus in the 17th century. It's pretty amazing, I think, that good high school students today, not to mention undergraduates, including, I assume, some, if there are students in this room, some of you, have already mastered at least the first stages of calculus. We take this fact for granted. I didn't take it for granted in high school, I can assure you, but. Uh, I think it, it maybe is a minor, but it's a stunning vindication, if you think about it, of the scientific premise that knowledge is incremental and accretive. That once a new truth is discovered, it does not have to be rediscovered, but can be passed on to those capable of grasping and extending it. You know, we commonly say we don't need to reinvent the wheel. That person is reinventing the wheel. Well, I'll get back to the validity of that way of talking. By means of this collaboration between the living and the dead, the modern university, I think we can say, became the most powerful institution in history for the production of new knowledge. And after the destruction of German academic culture by Nazism, of which one effect was a flow of refugee scholars and scientists to the United States, many of them right here, to Princeton, the American university emerged as the best in the world, which it has remained ever since, although we're starting to look over our shoulder at China and India. So now that my uh, galloping and obviously very foreshortened narrative has more or less reached the 20th century, I want to take another jump forward so we can get to the present to a comment made by one of the most important architects of the modern American university, Clark Kerr, the man who developed the famous California plan for higher education in the 1950s. In his Godkin lectures delivered at Harvard in 1963, Kerr looked back on everything I've been talking about in what became a classic little book called The Uses of the University. 
interestingly utilitarian title. When you get back be beyond that title, though, you discover that he actually thought that the key word university had already become obsolete. And so he proposed a new name, multiversity, for an institution so vast and diffuse that the faculty at his own campus, Berkeley, was best understood, he said, as a series of individual entrepreneurs held together by a common grievance over parking. <laughs> that more or less fits. I got an email from a colleague this afternoon. We had a faculty meeting at Columbia in the middle of this financial crisis, and no one showed up, more or less. That's how it goes. Anyway, since then, the president of Arizona State University, a man named Michael Crow, who is probably best known for the fact that his contract awards him a bonus for each step up, uh, up each notch up uh, Arizona State takes in the U.S. news rankings. Uh, Crow has suggested that this word, multiversity, too, has outlived its usefulness, so he has proposed yet another one. What he came up with is comprehensive knowledge enterprise, or CKE, a term meant to designate the decentered global network of laboratories, think tanks, corporations, governments, and research entities for which the local university campus is really just a convenient mailing address for anyone, that is, who uses paper mail anymore. In this brave new academic world, parking surely matters less than how long it takes to drive to the airport. Now, it should be obvious, and I hope not everything I'm saying is utterly obvious, that the driving force behind what I've been talking about was and is science. The reason why a great university needs more space is knowledge, the president of my own institution recently explained. It was quoted in the uh, New York Times. As it happens, he was speaking at a public hearing on the use of eminent domain to force private property owners out of the area into which Columbia wants to expand in the southwest corner of Harlem. But never mind that for the moment. As knowledge grows, he continued, a university needs more people, more classrooms, more laboratories. Now, it's true that there's talk of re relocating at Columbia our business school and School of the Arts to this new campus. But the, nevertheless, the first building scheduled to go up is a state-of-the-art research facility devoted to brain science. In other words, he's really talking about one particular kind of knowledge, scientific knowledge. And I think I would propose that humanistic knowledge does not so much grow as it changes in its internal proportions. When you get right down to it, humanists really don't need more space, even though we're always asking for it. In fact, with the digitization of the library, we probably need less space than we once had. Of course, new fields arise, ethnic studies, for instance, or the study of popular culture, which once had virtually no place in the university, or longer ago, the uh, uh, the rise of the study of various vernacular literatures. But these new fields tend to be accompanied by the decline and shrinkage of the old fields, classics, theology. Um, as students today are moving into Chinese and Arabic, they're moving out of French and German. Just ask your colleagues in French and German. I don't know what the numbers are at Princeton, but it's certainly happening at places I know about. Meanwhile, at all the major research universities today, the sciences are expanding, and with it, the universities themselves, in a physical sense. Harvard, making a big move into biogenetics, is expanding across the Charles River into Alston. Penn, into an undeveloped tract adjacent to its current campus, which gives it a certain advantage, because they're going to become much bigger, but they're still going to be linked together so you can actually walk or bicycle across the whole future campus. Yale announced a half-billion-dollar science initiative a few years ago and scooped the competition by buying outright an entirely new research campus near New Haven from a pharmaceutical company that didn't want it anymore. Now, it all makes a certain sense. Science clearly has proven itself. It's a good investment intellectually. Not all of it pays off, but sometimes it pays off in remarkable ways. 
And since 1980, when the Congress passed the Buy-Dole Act, permitting institutions to share in the profits earned from new therapies or technologies developed in part with public funds, with government grants, it's often a good investment financially, too. There was one uh, professor at our medical school who was personally responsible for something like $85 million a year coming into the university budget for about a decade. And I don't say that in any spirit of that this was crude or anything like he's a great scientist whose work um, uh, has made the world a better place. So science has an obvious impact, not always benign to be sure, on the lives of virtually everyone living and yet to be born. Transistors, lasers, computers, diagnostic machines, medical therapies, alternative sources of energy, or so we hope. The list goes on and on of what constitutes, from an increasingly prevalent point of view, the major return on public and private investment in higher education. That is, in part, what President Tillman was talking about when I quoted her yesterday as lamenting the fact that we're lagging behind in science education. And if we include the hard social sciences, such as they are under the same rubric, we could say that science can also be credited with devising rational principles for legal and financial systems, though it's not so clear how rational those are at the moment, managing the infrastructure of transport and commerce, promoting public health, and so on. So we arrive again at a version of my recurrent question. What does all this mean for those of us who still cling to the college idea that I, whose origins I tried to describe yesterday. The idea, that is, that at the center of the university, or the multiversity, or the CKE, we still find an undergraduate student trying to figure out how, or sometimes even why, to live. An adult in the making who needs all the help he or she can get from teachers and from books and from other students in beginning the arduous work of shaping a meaningful life. Now I'm going to say something very ahistorical, which I'm allowed to do because I'm not a bona fide historian. And that is that I don't think this student has changed all that much over the centuries. And maybe never will. Let me read you a passage I stumbled on by accident, more or less, my wife found this book in a used bookshop near uh, our house, in a minor novel by Harriet Beecher Stowe, written more than 150 years ago. It's, the passage is written in the voice of a middle-aged man looking back on his college years. During my last year, he says, the question, what are you good for, had often borne down like a nightmare upon me. When I entered college, all was distant, golden, indefinite, and I was sure that I was good for almost anything that could be named. Nothing that had ever been attained by man looked to me impossible. But as I measured myself with real tasks, and as I rubbed and grated against other minds and whirled round and round in the various experiences of college life, I grew smaller and smaller in my own esteem. And oftener and oftener in my lonely hours, it seemed as if some evil genius delighted to lord it over me and sitting at my bedside or fireside to say, what are you good for? To what purpose all the pains and money that have been thrown away on you? You'll never be anything. You'll only mortify your poor mother that has set her heart on you. Can any anguish equal the depths of those blues in which a man's whole self hangs in suspense before his own eyes and he doubts whether he himself, with his entire outfit and apparatus, body, soul, and spirit, isn't to be, after all, a complete failure? Better, he thinks, never to have been born than to be born to no purpose. I know a lot of seniors uh, who feel that way, actually. I might not put it quite that effusively. And when I said I think students have never changed, of course, there are nuances here. And in fact, the literature that I've looked at suggests that first-generation college goers tend to suffer from this kind of anxiety less than the children from affluent families who are, in most cases, uh, represented in institutions like this one. 
But whoever this student is, science, I think, won't be of much help to him unless you count pharmaceuticals. <laughs> science, and you know, I really don't mean to be disparaging, and I hope to correct any such impression in a moment, but science, with all its wonder, can't help us with the existential questions that face us all, whatever our origins or aptitudes or inclinations. We cannot appropriate and adapt the scientific principle of progress to such questions. We can't say, by analogy to the progressive paradigm of science, that, say, Defoe's Journal of a Plague Year published in 1722 or Camus' The Plague in 1947 contain more truth than Thucydides' 5th century BC commentary on the plague at Athens. Or that Joyce's Ulysses gives a more complete account of experience than did the Odyssey, probably composed more than two and a half millennia earlier. We can't fit literature and art into the paradigm of scientific progress, though some academics have tried and are trying to do so. Art never improves, as T.S. Eliot put the matter, although the material of art is never quite the same. In fact, one of the rewards of studying great writers from the past is to feel what Cardinal Newman felt when he first read Aristotle, that, and I quote, he has told us the meaning of our own words and ideas before we were born. Science tells us nothing about how to shape a life or how to face death, about the meaning of love or the scope of responsibility. It not only fails to answer such questions, it cannot ask them. Some people believe that someday it will do both, that in some future age of consilience, neuroscience will define and ensure happiness and prove or disprove the insights of religion into the nature of sin and salvation. Biochemistry will distinguish truth from falsity among what today are mere opinions about sex and gender, Indeed, that all human choices will become susceptible to experimental testing and rational sorting. Maybe it will happen, but none of us will be around when it does, and I'm not sure I want to be. Meanwhile, we wait. It's literature, art, and music that speak to us in a subversive whisper that says the idea of progress on which the modern university is finally based is a sham. They tell us that the questions we face under the shadow of death are not new and that no new technology will help us answer them. These questions are those raised in great books and works of art that have unfortunately, from my point of view, lately been ceded as the property of the political right, which has been allowed to claim them for their own, while in fact the idea of what we sometimes call a core curriculum made up of such great books has no politics. It has only a tremendous power for provocation. We are provoked to ask if we read the Iliad, does Achilles' concept of honor have any force for us today? Or if we read Walden, can we bear to live even as we're told we have to? Can we bear to live according to Thoreau's ethic of minimal exploitation of nature? Or is there in fact a basis in experience, perhaps, even if we're not Christians, for the Augustinian idea of original sin as expounded in the Confessions. Such questions do not yield to ideological answers, and they do not admit of verifiable answers in the mode of science, because the experiment to which we must subject them is the experiment of our own lives. So, What's the inference, the payoff, or the point, or as an historian I once knew used to ask somewhat cruelly after a very dutiful graduate student worked very hard on a long seminar report, what's the news in what I've said so far? Well, I don't know that there's any news, but the point I'd like to stress, even if it's an old one, is that the evolution of academic institutions has at least largely and often been at the expense of what might be called the spiritual life of undergraduates. 
And I use the word spiritual not to mystify the matter, but to dignify it. Everyone knows this in a certain sense, and it's been known for a long time. Max Weber, the great German social theorist who held posts in several German universities early in the 20th century, put it this way. One can be a preeminent scholar and at the same time an abominably poor teacher. Fifty years later, we find Clark Kerr asserting that this inverse correlation between research and teaching is not just a possible or probable effect of modern university culture, it's an inevitable effect. The cruel paradox, he wrote, is that a superior faculty results in an inferior concern for undergraduate teaching. This is not the language of contingency, it's the language of cause and effect. Now, of course, and I want to stress this, this doesn't mean that individual faculty members don't want the best for their youngest and least professionalized students. It certainly doesn't mean that scientists are less caring than humanists. On the contrary, scientists, in my experience, tend to be more responsible about maintaining a coherent curriculum and evaluating their students' progress through it. In a recent book, Harvard's now twice former president, Derek Bach, praises one physics professor for abandoning his old teaching method once he discovered that many students in his introductory physics class were failing to grasp the basic concept. So instead of lecturing for the full hour, he broke his students into small groups in which they worked through problems together. He required problem sets before lecture so he could see what they had gleaned from the textbook presentation of the assigned topic. He administered frequent checkup quizzes and so on, and lo and behold, student learning improved. Maybe it's something about physicists. I have a cousin who taught physics at Cornell back in the 60s, and he desired, decided to wire the lecture room with buttons at the seats and a console at the lectern so that after he had presented a concept, he could ask the students to answer a question. He could look at this thing and see whether most of them got it. And if they didn't, he would go back over it again. And if they did, he would go on to the next point. But I want to step back from the question, and it's an important one, and one that we have paid, I think, insufficient attention to, the question of how to measure and improve the cognitive development of students and reach instead for a broader sense of what the whole college aims for in teaching the whole student. And here it's my impression that the picture today is pretty bleak. Very few colleges today provide anything resembling a coherent curriculum that expresses anything like a consensual, consensual sense in the faculty of what it means to be an educated person. The highest profile efforts to create such a curriculum lately have been spectacular failures. Last year, after years of fanfare, the Harvard faculty, which the media always looks to for leading the way, concluded its curriculum review and got this, I think, rather savvy reaction from the student paper. This was the editorial in the Crimson. Instead of crafting a meaningful statement of what it means to be educated in today's world, Professors only seem to care about their parochial corner of academia, leaving Harvard with an uninspired retread of its old core curriculum, which was, at least in my view, pretty incoherent in the first place. Tony Cronman, whom I mentioned yesterday, puts it this way, even at our best colleges and universities, students spend four years sampling courses with little or no connection moved by fancy and curiosity, but guided by no common organizing principle or theme. At Columbia, and I think you'll agree I can't be accused of being a Columbia booster most of the time, but at Columbia we have a core curriculum that dates back now almost 100 years. And when my sometime colleague Arnold Rampersad, who stopped here in Princeton for a while on his way west to Stanford, came back for the 75th anniversary of the Columbia Corps. He made a wonderful statement. He said, you know, the core curriculum is something very much like the interstate highway system. We're extremely grateful that we have it, but we could never build it today. Now, in the absence of some kind of coherence at the heart of the college experience, and each institution will have its own version. 
consistent with its own traditions, otherwise it wouldn't, couldn't possibly work. But in the absence of some kind of coherence, we run the risk, if you'll permit me to adapt Yeats's famous line, that the modern university, multiversity, CKE, whatever you want to call it, is a widening gyre in which the center does not hold. Or since, as I said before, I take every opportunity to invoke Melville, one might say that many undergraduate students I feel that they've been thrown overboard, like the cabin boy Pip, bobbing alone in an immense and heartless o ocean, their ringed horizon expanding miserably around them. Now, with those comforting, upbeat images in mind, let me propose in these last few minutes to take a very quick and undoubtedly partial and distorted tour of undergraduate culture in the United States at the present time, which is something I'll be talking about more tomorrow. According to some recent studies, the average college student spends nearly four hours per day watching television, and something like 40% of college freshmen engage in binge drinking at least once a week which might be a kind of degraded effort to recapture some sense of community. In fact, you, you start looking at these studies and you, you wonder whether a weird pattern of fours is starting to appear. 44% of first-year college students, according to one study, never discuss an idea or something they've read with a professor outside of class. Fewer than one in four college students can name a single right protected by the First Amendment. I'll drop the fours and give you some other numbers. Bill knows where these data come from. A recent study of roughly 10,000 freshmen at 53 colleges found that during freshman year, prejudices against ethnic and racial minorities actually deepen, while curiosity about the world and voluntary reading slacken. Now, these statistics don't describe only what is sometimes called the lower end of the academic spectrum, and I don't much like those spatial terms, you know, bottom tier, middle tier, top tier, which tend most often to refer only to degrees of prestige. It's the former dean of Harvard College who writes, with his college in mind, universities affect horror when students attend college in the hope of becoming financially successful but they offer students neither a coherent view of the point of a college education nor any guidance on how they might discover for themselves some larger purpose in life. And I've heard Larry Summers himself, the man who fired the dean who wrote that, complain that a large percentage of Harvard seniors cannot explain why it's winter in some parts of the earth and why it's summer in others at the same time which is kind of a serious problem if we consider that the two cultures problem, as it was defined over 50 years ago, has got to be more important today than ever, right? When we have the power to poison the earth, when we're on the verge of making genetic changes in our own species, it would be a good idea to have scientifically informed humanists and humanistic scientists. I think there are more of the latter, actually, than of the former. But it would be a good idea if our educational institutions could get serious about trying to address that problem. Larry Summers also said he didn't like the fact that at least at that time there was not a single course in the Harvard uh, curriculum in which a student could study the revolutionary and constitutional period of American history. Now, I suspect he wasn't very diplomatic when he went to the history department and suggested that they rectify that problem. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't right to be concerned. Now, I should say that I've been talking a lot about the research universities because my narrative today has been about the rise of these institutions. But, of course, these problems are not pertinent exclusively to those institutions because the faculty of our small liberal arts colleges are trained in research universities. That's the culture they, they come out of. Uh, and yet, in most PhD programs that I know anything about, there is little or no attention. I heard a graduate of the Yale PhD program in English, who's now the president of a liberal arts college, say that in all his years in New Haven studying in what was widely regarded as the greatest 
literature department in the world, he never spent 10 minutes talking with a faculty member about what would be entailed or what it might mean to teach literature to undergraduate students. It never came up. This situation in arts and sciences would be the equivalent of Harvard or Hopkins Medical School announcing that they've decided to save time and be more efficient, let their, 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 their medical students focus on their research to do away with all the clinical rotations. No need for them to learn anything about taking care of patients. I'll get back to that point tomorrow. Now, continuing a little longer with this cheerful tour of undergraduate culture, I'm looking forward to a couple of drinks pretty soon. Uh, we all know that in a whole range of institutions, I gather you have some things you're doing about it here at Princeton, cheating is rampant. College students can choose among numerous websites offering term papers for sale, and there are all kinds of sophisticated ways now of doing cut-and-paste plagiarism, as it's called, so that you can write, and I've seen some of these, they're kind of brilliant in their own way. Paper that, that really sounds coherent and fluid, but has absolutely not a single thought uh, on the part of the putative author of the paper. Um, the, my favorite website, I don't know if it's still up and running, has the winningly candid name cheathouse.com. And now, of course, we see a sort of arms race between websites that help the students cheat and websites that help the faculty catch the cheaters so that you, know, you run the paper through the website and so on. I have a colleague at Columbia, and I kid you not, as Jack Parr used to say, who's visibly relieved when he gets a student paper that's so bad that he doesn't have to worry that it's been plagiarized. <laughs> and I know a couple of faculty members who entertain themselves at every commencement by going through the list of graduating seniors, picking out those whom they know personally to have cheated, and that's just two faculty members, and who are graduating all the same, in many cases, with honors. In short, to be blunt about it as if I have to be more blunt, I'm suggesting that the, the culture of our colleges is breaking down. The idea that I was talking about yesterday as, of college as a place of mutual edification in the moral sense, uh, that college is a place that's about building something called character, talked about yesterday, is in a lot of trouble. Now, I don't think we can blame the students exactly, though taking responsibility is a good thing all around. But how could you not be a little cynical about the character of these exalted institutions if you're a student? If, for example, and I don't mean to pick all the time on my alma mater, but they are sort of an irresistible target, um, for years, Harvard defended its early admissions policy. It said it's an incredibly gifted group of early applicants, and we were just as tough on them as we are on the regular applicants, and we really believe uh, that it's fine. Then all of a sudden, they turned around uh, and got on their high horse and announced that it was ending early admissions on the grounds of equity and fairness, that all applicants would now be informed, would, be, would apply at the same time, and would be informed at the same time about whether they were admitted or not. Then the Crimson, which is actually a pretty damn good newspaper, reported the embarrassing fact that the Harvard at that very moment was sending out something like 200 likely letters several months in advance to recruited athletes and other students saying, you know what, you're going to get in unless you really blow it. How could you not be a little cynical about these institutions when colleges decry the SAT? They say, this doesn't really tell us anything about our applicants. We don't believe it anymore. We're going to make it optional. We don't require it. What happens when you make it optional? Naturally, only the students with good scores report the scores. And then you take the scores and send them into U.S. News and World Report, and your rankings looks good. Well, what about colleges? And, you know, I feel a little, it's, it's a little easy to make these accusations because there's always a counter-argument. Colleges that have to worry a lot about what their trustees feel and how proud their, own, their, their, their alumni, their donors feel about their institution. But some of these colleges in recent years have made a practice of rejecting Applicants they, that they know are very well qualified, but that they're guessing won't come in order to in, improve their yield rate. They don't want to have to report that 
only a relatively small percentage of those whom they accept uh, have come. Or what about one university, Baylor University, that's recently been paying freshmen who have already been admitted to retake the SAT so they can report a higher average score for the incoming class? There's something wrong with this culture. And uh, it's, it's not about pointing the finger, but there's something wrong about it from the top to the bottom. Now, we could talk about the faculty. What about the administrators? Well, just quickly, uh, about 100 years ago, the president of the American Psychological Association wrote, it's undesirable for a university president to receive three or four times the salary of the greatest scholar or teacher on the faculty. You know what's happened to presidential salaries since then. It doesn't compare to the bonuses on Wall Street or the CEOs of the three automobile companies compared to the workers in the UAW, but still, it's a hell of a lot higher than three or four times by now. And that doesn't count the corporate board memberships that many university presidents enjoy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. A few have been embarrassed recently and have made public announcements about giving back a percentage of their pay. In short and in sum, our colleges are as full as they ever have been of high-sounding language about social justice and service and high ideals. All the stuff I was talking about yesterday, they talk the talk, but there's a real question in the public mind, and I tend actually in a certain weird way to trust the public. There's a, there's a real question of whether they walk the walk. More and more faculty are part-timers, ruefully called road scholars. So many that one vice president for human resources, a gutsy guy at an institution in the Southwest, recently stepped forward as a kind of academic whistleblower and accused the academy in general of being a less honest employer than Walmart. Now, I hope I've said enough, probably too much, to suggest some of the reasons why the public these days evinces what I think we could call a strange combination of desire and derision toward college. Why Sarah Palin, we thought we were rid of her, but I'll bring her into this story for one more second. Why Sarah Palin thought she might get some traction by turning the election into a contest between the good guy, Joe Sixpack, who morphed into Joe the Plumber, and the bad guy, Joe College. Joe College doesn't have a very good reputation these days. And that's true whether you look to the right or the left. The assessment of our colleges is not very flattering. On the right, you find Tom Wolfe's recent college novel, possibly modeled loosely on Duke University, in which students seem always to have their mouths fastened to the spigot of a beer keg, except when taking a break to have sex. And some of them, apparently, are able to do both simultaneously. On the left, former student of mine, Bill Derizowitz, uh, also a former professor at Yale, concluded after his years teaching there that the main thing an elite education teaches these days is, and I quote, that people who didn't go to an Ivy League or equivalent school aren't worth talking to. And then there's the professor at a leading liberal arts college who wrote pseudonymously a few weeks ago in the Chronicle of Higher Education, I think that's where it was under the title, I'm Leaving, to say that his students, and this was a very fine liberal arts college, his students seemed to perceive college as an overnight recreation center or as a four-year cruise without a destination. Next time, I will turn to how the ship might set a better course and who ought to be brought aboard for the trip. Thanks very much.